Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, as Pastor said, um, he, I'm up to bat. Amen. It's not the ninth inning stretch, but uh, a seventh inning stretch. Praise the Lord. But uh, he put me up to bat. And uh, just some things that already God brought out um, are exactly what I was going to preach on this morning. So that's really cool. Uh, and uh, thank you, Pablo, for saying that because that was right in line with what I'm going to hit on this morning. And uh, can we do something just real quick before we get started? Um, as you know, I got some props. Um, I do work with teenagers, so I do get some craziness every now and then. Uh, but can we do something real quick? Can we just stand back up real quick? And let's do something that our pastor has been preaching to us over the past couple weeks. And let's give God some praise right now. Amen. Let's give us some praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give him some praise because you know that in the end, he's got the victory. Give him some praise because you know that no matter what you're facing, God's got the answer. Give him some praise because you know that we win at the end of the book. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. You can be seated. I just like to do that every now and then, get my praise on. It's okay. We're in church. You can do it here. But if you can't do it here, you're not going to do it anywhere else. Okay. Um, but praise the Lord. It's good to do it here. So we're going to start off this morning. Go to Luke chapter 4 real quick. And um, I want to read you something that I've been studying out. We're going to talk about the battlefield of the mind, and we're going to talk about uh, the weapons of our warfare. You know, Apostle Paul, um, he gave us some listing of our weapons in Ephesians uh, chapter 6. And um, I want to as I was studying, um, I want to read you something, but the devil's name, you know, the devil is our adversary. He's our enemy. He's the dude that we're fighting against, okay? We're not fighting for, we fight against him because he's got nothing but bad for you, okay? So we're going against him because he's got bad, God's got good, amen. So the devil's name, if you look it up, it means Beelzebub, is another name for the devil, is Beelzebub. Um, the Jewish people back in, back in the Old Testament, they translate it to Beelzebub, which means Lord of the dunghill or Lord of the manure or the poop. Now, I'm going to break this down. You're like, what are you breaking down poop? Yeah, we're breaking down poop. Never thought you'd come to church and break down some poop. But anyway, I was watching a, a kid's movie with my son. This was six months back. And this kid's movie was named Captain Underpants. And I was watching it, and maybe it's just my generation or something, but I'm watching this movie, and I'm thinking, how in the world did this movie ever get past the writing stages? I'm thinking, how did this end up in a movie theater? And I'm like, this is the craziest movie I've ever seen for kids. I mean, I'm thinking my, my generation was G.I. Joe. Okay, we had some cartoons. All right, thank you. Uh, you know, we had X-Men. We had all this cool stuff, and they got Captain Underpants. I'm like, is this just a bad kid's joke or something? Well, I'm watching the movie, and, and I'm just like, I'm kind of ha having a little attitude as a parent. I'm like, i got to sit through this movie. got to sit through this movie. Okay, okay, this is cool. So I'm sitting through the movie, and during the movie, the Lord, the, the enemy, the, the bad guy in the movie, his name is Professor Poopy Pants. And what the funny thing about it is, in the movie, the, the Professor Poopy Pants does not want people to be happy. He is against laughter. Doesn't that sound familiar? Well, our pastor last week had us do a little laughing at the devil. And so when you look at the devil, I like to look at it, He's like Professor Poopy Pants. Everybody makes fun of him. And guess what? You can just laugh at him because that's who he is. Amen? And here's the thing. When it says Lord of the Poop or the Dunghill, here's the thing about the devil. He looks good from a distance. But have you ever noticed, ever walked up to somebody who stinks? You see, a, I'm just going to break it down here, right? You see someone, who, you know, as, as a young person, when I was single, I, I'd see a, a good-looking girl. I'd walk up to her. But if I, she stank, as soon as I got closer, the looks just went out the window. The stink came in. Okay, the looks went out, the stink came in. I'm like, okay, back up. Do a little MC Hammer dance. But here, here's the thing, back it up a little bit. Here's the thing with the devil, he looks good, but when you get in following him, he stinks. And here's the thing, he mean, it also means, his name means Belial, which means worthless. Satan actually is taken from the Hebrew word, the original Hebrew is shatana, which means, now check this out, to, to accuse and to hate. 
It carries an idea of slander and false accusation. Here's the thing. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Go to verse 1. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And this is Jesus. I'm going to break this down. This is Jesus getting tempted. Now, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the the Spirit in the wilderness. How many in here? If you got led into the wilderness, you'd be like, is that really God? I want to go to some place nice, but you're leading me to the wilderness. He was led into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. Jesus ate nothing all the time and became very hungry. I don't know about you, but I can go a couple meals, and then I'm getting an attitude. If I miss a couple meals, I get a little irritated. Anybody here get a little irritated missing a meal or two? Okay. Jesus didn't miss just a meal or two. He's going on 40 days without food. At that point, I'd probably be a little upset. I'd be like, I need some food because I want to live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Amen. Jesus here was seeing that he was 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus ate nothing at the time and became very hungry. When the Bible says very, it means very. It doesn't mean little, okay? When the Bible says very, it means very. Here's the thing. Then the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus said to him, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And in verse 6, it says, I will give you the glory of all these kingdoms and the authority over all of them. Then the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Verse 8, Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him up to Jerusalem and to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and guard you. And they will hold you up with their hands so you won't ever hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures say you must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. Now, I want to break this down for you a little more. When the devil here said, when he said, if you'll do this, if you'll do that, Jesus answered to him, And did a a great thing here that we need to take note of. Here's what he did. Now check this out. Notice the devil left him until the next opportunity came. Let me break this down. The devil tempted him with opportunity. Did he not? I tell this young people all the time because their lives, their decisions that they make their lives, most of their decisions that affect the rest of their lives happen when they're between the ages, I think, is 15 and 25. And I tell them this. I said, you've got to know how to be led by the Spirit and not led by opportunity. Here's the thing. Opportunity will come and go. Some opportunity is God. Some opportunity may not be from God. Just because everything looks rosy does not mean it's from God. Just because the door is closed does not mean it's not God. And here's the thing. The devil here was tempting him through opportunity. He tempted him through need. And he tempted him, at the last part, he tempted him testing his faith. Here's the thing, the the, the devil comes to test whether you believe what you really believe. He comes at you. Here's the thing, he tested him by, with a need. He said, he says, I will fulfill your need. Some of you are in here saying, you've you've looked at your, 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 your situation, you say, well, I just need that new car. You know what, a salesman will tell you every day of the week at a car salesman that you need a new car. You could have a car for a month and they'll say, you need a new car. Does that need mean you need a new car? No. And here's the thing. Some of y'all are saying, well, if I was just married, I need a spouse. Do you need a spouse right now? Praise the Lord. See, God will, God, see, see, here's the thing. The devil will throw things at you sometimes, and you got to know, is this God or is this of the enemy? Check out what Jesus said here. We're going to talk about this. But Jesus said here, I want you to notice here. Ever notice it? Check, check this out. Jesus said in verse 4, verse 8, and verse 12, he said this, it is written. It is written. It is written. Jesus here showed us how to take on the whole entire armor of God. Now, I've got this prop up here. You all see this prop, okay? This was as authentic as I could get without spending thousands of dollars, praise the Lord. I put this on for the teenagers in youth service, okay? When I put this on, this thing weighs probably 100 pounds, maybe more. I was like the tin man in in Wizard of Oz, okay? I don't know how these dudes fought in these things, all right? I got some strength, but these dudes had to have been super strong to wear these things and go into battle. And here's the thing. This armor, this this illustrates a lot of the Roman armor. 
Paul the Apostle, let me break this down to you. When Paul the Apostle in Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to go there in a second. But in Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul the Apostle wrote about the armor of God, he was put into jail. And here's the funny thing about that story. Paul the Apostle, he, w- he lived during a time of a, a, a Roman emperor named Nero. Nero was a bad dude. He was not your best friend, okay? Nero had gone to the Roman Senate, little history. He had gone to the Roman Senate and, and proposed that they tear down half the city of Rome and build statues in his honor. The Roman Senate voted and said, no, you can't do that. Nero said, watch this. So Nero went behind the Senate, got some of his servants to go torch the city of Rome, burned half of it down. The Senate put two and two together. They figured out, huh, we just voted on Rome being restructured and Rome being half of it being torn down, and here conveniently half of it gets burned down. It's Nero. So the Senate was going to get Nero to take him to trial to execute him. Nero, like he is, trying to preserve his life like any villain would do, (laughs) he blames it on the Christians. Does that not sound familiar? I I swear, today's day and age, if something's wrong, blame it on the Christians. Something going on in society, blame it on the Christians. Well, Nero, he does what's natural in that society and says, blame it on the Christians. He blames the Christians. Well, guess what? Paul was one of the most well-known Christians at the time. So Paul gets thrown in jail as a Christian for doing nothing. How many in here have ever been accused of something you didn't do? Had people gossip about you about something that's not you? Had people say stuff about you that's not you? And here, the whole time, the whole time, Paul the Apostle sitting in jail. The fact of the matter was Paul was so busy on his missionary journeys, he was so busy that he didn't have the time to sit down and write more of the, the, the epistles that God was going to have him write. But guess what the devil did? The devil tried to throw his butt in jail. And what's funny, because when the devil threw him in jail, the devil didn't realize something very key here. The devil didn't realize when he, by throwing Paul in jail, he gave Paul more time to write the prison epistles, which are some of the most powerful scriptures in the entire Bible, for us to live in the new covenant as Christians to live victoriously here on this planet, that no matter what we face, we know we got some armor, we've got some protection, and we've got some battle weapons to attack the enemy when he comes at us. And here's the thing. You may feel like you're in a prison. You may feel like, man, I've been struggling this. My, my son's dealing with this. My spouse is dealing with this. I'm dealing with this craziness. But God wants to say, no matter what prison you feel like you're in, you need to start rejoicing because two-thirds of your life is not done being written yet because I've given you the armor of God. And just because the enemy puts you in a prison in the natural doesn't mean that God can't move through you. That God cannot give you the victory in your life. That God cannot move when you never thought he could move. Amen? And here's the thing with Paul. He thought, I'm sure Paul in the prison, he's thinking, dear Lord, I'm obeying God. And I just got thrown into a Roman prison. And those prisons, they didn't have, you know, they didn't have TV. They didn't have workout room facilities. They didn't even have a bathroom. So guess what it smelled like in there? wasn't Calvin Klein. Praise the Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We would go there, but I don't have time to rewind the Blu-ray. But um, anyway, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, real quick. It says, my people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge. Destroyed is actually a military combat term. Destroyed summarizes the conditions of a person after they lost the conflict. Here's the thing. Hosea 4, 6, it says, my people are destroyed for the lack of what knowledge? The knowledge of the word of God. Here's the thing. Paul, our combat is the word of God. Our foundation is the word of God in our lives. We've got to get to the point where we realize, and I I brought this visual up for you, is that you have weapons. You have armor. Too many times we look at the Word of God and we look at our situation and say, well, this is just a book, and I don't have this, and I don't have that, and I don't have this. But you've got some armor. You've got some protection. You've got some things you can attack the enemy with. Now, here's, here's the thing. Isaiah chapter four, 5, verse 13, it says, my, Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. 
captivity. Another battle analogy. Another military analogy. Here's the thing. I'll break it down for you. When you know some things about the Word of God, you can fight some things that come against you. When you have a knowledge that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, it's not just a saying. It's not just a verse that you read off a page, but you know you've got the greater one inside of you. You know he's inside of you. When you face something, you know that whatever that situation is, that, that doctor's report, that healing report, that, 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 that bill that came in the mail that you can't pay, you know that greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. That every time I face this, I know my God will have me come out victoriously. There's no question. There's no whether it will or will not. It's the word of God. It says it. And that is it. I believe it. And that settles it. See, the, here's the thing about the word of God. Here's the word of God. John 8, verse 32. Jesus said this, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You know what? That situation in your life that, that it has you bound has you locked up, has you shackled like the Apostle Paul in prison. God wants to break you free from that. God wants to break you out of that. God wants to let you know that if you know the truth of God's word, it'll break you free. It'll get you out of your situation. Here's the thing. We're going to talk about this today, but I, I, and I, we're going to go into more of it, but I want to just tell you real quickly here. The devil doesn't, ju doesn't just come in a big red suit. He doesn't come in a big red suit with a cape. I just got done, uh, we watched the movie the, the Avengers, and it was a cool movie. I'm a comic book fan, and I had a, a little critiquing of it, but that's just me. Um, by the way, the guy in that video, he had, a, he had a Captain America shirt on. That was cool. I need to get to know him. We need to, yeah, anyway. Uh, so, but here's the thing. The devil, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, we know about this, where, where Adam and Eve were, were tempted, and they were, they, they were following. The devil came, it says, Verse 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. Satan was, is more subtle than anything God had made. Think about that. It was more subtle. That means it didn't come, Satan didn't come and say, Hey, I'm Satan. I'm here to destroy you. No. He comes like, I'm your best friend. What's up? How you doing? Let's chat. Let's kick it. And the whole time he's got in his mind, how can I destroy you? See, the enemy doesn't come with just a big uh, a picture in your face saying, well, I'm here. This is me. No, he comes subtly. He comes through situations. He comes through sickness. He comes through, through bills in the mail sometimes. He comes through things that, and bills are not, bills are good. You need to pay them. But I'm saying sometimes, sometimes he comes through situations with your kids talking back to you. Praise the Lord. Your, your, your teenager not serving God or your, your, your spouse not serving God or your, your family members not serving God or things being thrown at you, situations, uh, the, your, your, the storm we had, the fe your fence blows over and you got to get a new fence. He's there to harass you. He's there to put little things in your life saying, oh, look at this, look at that. And he's subtle. And see, that's the problem that we have as human beings is we don't see the fact that it's subtle. So we think, oh, I can do this, I can take this, I can deal with this. And we forget about the word of God in our lives. you got to know your enemy. He's subtle. He's subtle. He tempted Jesus. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. It says in verse 11, it says, it talks about this. Let me go, let me actually do the King James Version real quick here. I got a ton of different versions, but I'm trying to make sure I get the right one. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God, not just part of it, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles e equals methods of trickery. If you look that up, it means methods of trickery. Here's the thing. The devil is like a trickster. He's like a magician. He wants to trick you into thinking that things are not what they really are. If we study this out, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, go there real quick. It says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know what devices means? Devices, if you look it up, it actually means it's, it refers to, uh, in the wilds, it refers to false realities. 
Think about that. The reason why the devil brings sickness and disease, he brings, he brings financial struggles. He bring, he's trying to bring false realities to you. Now, in the natural, it is a reality. But here's the thing. It's a false reality because it goes against the word of God. The word of God is the reality. Your situation is a false reality. God wants to change your situation to his situation. And what I mean is that knowing that it's not of God. We talked about John 8, 13, two, verse two, 32, but here's the thing. The key, and Pastor talked about before, but the key to living victoriously in life is winning the battle of this mind. We're going to go into this, but in Galatians, it talks about how the flesh wants to sin. Pastor talked about this a couple weeks ago, how faith is not led by emotions. Or feel, I'm sorry, feelings. It's not led by feelings. It's not based on what you feel. Well, I, I don't feel it. Well, that Bible doesn't talk about faith with feeling. We've got to get to the point where we understand that your mind is the entryway into your spirit. Your mind's the entryway. Your spirit, man, is made and formed that it will naturally produce and grow whatever seeds are put into it. That means if you got seeds that aren't from God that are flowing through your gateway and down into your spirit, man, those seeds will produce that fruit in your life. But if you're sowing seeds into your mind that are godly seeds, they will, the seeds will go into your spirit, man, and they will produce that fruit. It's a garden. It produces. Whatever is put inside of it, it will produce. God formed it that way. And that's what God meant for it. Here's the thing. By winning the battle in your mind, you prevent the enemy from putting things in, in, into your head, into your spirit, man. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Whatsoever things are true, honest, and just, think on these things. That's why God talked about it. Those things are true and honest. Those things are about the word of God. We need to start thinking on those things. We need to put those things. Uh, Romans five seventeen. it says, uh, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's all by faith. You can't, we serve the image in Colossians, it says the image of the invisible God. We serve an invisible God. So if we're basing our situations on what we can see with our natural minds, we've already lost. We have to base our situations based on the word of God, not based on what we see. Because this is the book of power, the book of that reminds us of who we are and what we can do. They're, it's the truth. It's the truth. Go to Isaiah, and we're, we're going to look at some examples here. But some examples about people that were, that, that couldn't, you know, that, that had this situation happen. The devil, here's the thing, there's a couple things. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, in verse 17 Real quick here. I'm just going to go there. Glory to God. This is Satan himself. Now, I'm going to break it down. This Not everything that comes to you is, of the de is from the devil. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. It says real quickly, it says, How that are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how that are cut down to the ground, which dis weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. Guess what? Satan did not become like the most high. He did not ascend on high. In fact, he got his butt kicked and slammed down to earth. He got slammed. He got his tail kicked. Now, here's the thing. Notice here. Thou hast said in thine heart. Your heart's your spirit, man. When he said in his heart, he got that down in his heart. That was a thought that he got in himself that he could go against God. Here's the thing. Satan got a thought that went against God. Sometimes you will have a thought that won't be necessarily from Satan. It'll be just a thought. Because here's the thing. Thoughts sometimes come through your ear gate 
or your eye gate. Think about it. When, when, when David uh, fell with Bathsheba, it says he saw her. That's where he fell into sin. Nowhere does it say that the devil tempted him. Who tempted the devil? Well, the devil had a thought. So some thoughts are from God, and some thoughts are from us, and some thoughts are from the devil. So then we've got to come to a point where we can identify where these thoughts are coming from. Here's the thing to the battlefield of the mind in order to overcome everything. You're given, Paul went through all these in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Praise the Lord. And uh, we're going to go there in a sec. But um, go to Ephesians 6, 16 actually real quick. We're going to go there. But this armor of God, there's so many different weapons. You might say, well, why did Paul give us so many weapons? Why did he describe it? Why don't you just say, put on a whole armor suit, and that's it. Well, the reason why Paul listed so many weapons in his armor, the reason why he went through all these, because Paul was trying to give us a picture of just how powerful God is in our lives. I'm here to tell you guys, when we get into fear and doubt is when we need to start looking back at all those weapons and realize we've got so much weaponry in our arsenal, it's ridiculous. I, was stu- I studied this whole thing out. I went through the Greek and all this stuff with, with Paul's armor. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, it says, quench means to, uh, it says, to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. We're going to talk about quench here in a minute. But I went through all this armor and went into Greek. And here's the thing. The shoes. Now, most people don't even look at the shoes. When they think of armor, they don't think of shoes. But the shoes that the Roman soldiers wore, on the bottom of them, they had about that thick of spikes on the bottom of their shoes, all over the bottom. Now, I can't wear those because I don't want to cut up the carpet and I don't want to hurt anybody. But they were that thick of spikes. Let me break this down for you. You're going to get excited here in a second. That thick of spikes on those sandals, those Roman soldiers said, when he said the shod with the, 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 the shoes of peace, when he talked about the shoes with peace of God, when you walk in the peace of God, I'm going to break down the peace of God for you real quick here. The peace of God is confidence in God. You've got confidence that every morning you're going to wake up. You've got confidence that when it's dinner time, you're going to eat dinner. You've got confidence, hey, you've got confidence that when you walk down the street, your legs are going to move. Guess what? If you've got confidence in God's words that when he says something in his word, it will come to pass in your life, you've got peace. When you don't have confidence, you don't have peace. Here's the thing. Those shoes, those Roman soldiers would use those shoes so they could, when they were in battle and they were pushing against an enemy that was pushing against them, they could be sturdy enough so that it could get traction in the ground so that the enemy could not move them. Think about this. How many times the enemy's trying to throw things at your life or things are coming against you in your life and you're trying to fight against it and you're losing traction. It feels like you're going backwards and going backwards and going back. If you would just step up with your confidence in God and know that your confidence saying God has this situation, it'll give you traction to hold back whatever the enemy's trying to fly at your life. And here's the thing. When the, another thing about those shoes, they were an offensive weapon. I'm just talking about the shoes. I haven't gotten to the sword yet. I even hit the shield or the helmet. I'm just talking about the shoes. My wife, see, I love my wife so much. One time she's like, oh, my nails aren't painted. I looked at her. I said, I don't care if your nails are. I don't look at your nails. I don't care about your nails. Your nails are fine. Your feet are fine. I don't look at your feet. She's like, would you just be quiet? Feet are important to us. I was like, I don't care. The feet, feet, you know, you use them to walk. They use them to go. They, sometimes they stink. Whatever. I don't know. Anyway, I said, you're beautiful. You don't need to worry about painting your toenails. That didn't go over too well. Anyway, uh, so, uh, but I, the, the feet were an offensive weapon. The shoes were an offensive weapon because those spikes, they would use those spikes when the enemy would be on the ground to finish their enemy off and take them by their head and put those spikes in their head. And they would crush the skull and the entrails would come out of their head. You're like, 
I'm not eating pizza after this service. It's all right. I won't, I, I, I'm sorry. I apologize. But ch- check this out. Remember in the book of Genesis where God said to the devil, I'm going to bruise your head? Think about it. Think about that. I don't think God just meant a little bruise. I don't think he meant, oh, I'll just have a little scratch on the side of your head. When you walk in the confidence and the peace of God, you literally crush his skull. And guess what? That's not even half of it. We're not even done with the rest of this. This shield right here, this breastplate of righteousness. The Roman soldiers, when they would wear these breastplates, the more they would wear them, the more they would march around with them. And this sucker's heavy. Trust me, it's heavy. I've wore it. I swept my butt off trying to wear it. The, 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 the breastplate, the metal parts, they would rub together. If you can see these metal parts, they're like little, little plates. And they would rub together. The more they, and the more they would rub, rub together, the more they would become bright. The, 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 the uh, metal would, would become brighter and brighter. And as they become brighter, when the enemy tried to come and attack them, the enemy would get blinded by their armor. I mean, you blind the enemy, you crush his skull in, and we haven't even gotten to the sword. So here's the thing I want to break down. If you don't remember a lot of what I said this morning, remember that you've got such an arsenal behind you that whatever you face, no matter how big the mountain is, no matter how big this is, that's why Jesus said, speak to the mountain. That's why you say, well, I can't speak to a mountain. The mountain's too big. No, the mountain's not too big because look at all you got. Whatever that situation you're like you're facing, God has it by his word. And that's the thing with our minds. We got to get our minds brainwashed on the word of God. You're going to get it brainwashed on something. Well, he's brainwashed. Well, he's brainwashed on something. Get it washed on the word of God. Get it washed with the word of God. Praise the Lord. Okay, we're going to go real quick. We're going <laughs> to. Okay, go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 6 back there again. And uh, it says, verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's key there. We don't wrestle about what we see in the natural. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't fight that battle but against powers, against rulers of darkness of the world, against spiritual weakness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand the evil of the day. Having done all to stand, stand. Having your loins girt with the truth, having your blessed prayer of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherein we shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, technically, all of it is the word of God. It all has to do with the Word of God. But here's the thing. I'm going to break this down for you. I'm going to hit with the sword real quickly. This sword is a gladiator sword. Okay? Here's the cool thing about this sword. When it says sword in the Word of God, it actually in the Greek means manchura. That's what I read on it. Hopefully I'm correct on that. Manchura. It's a manchura sword. And... um, what the Manchura sword was was the two-edged sword for the Roman Empire. The Romans used to have, they started off with a one-edged sword when they first went out to battle. They went with a one-edged sword. And uh, they, they fought a big battle against the, the northern armies of Gaul. And for some of you who study history, they utterly, the Roman army was one of the only battles that they utterly got their tails kicked. And the army of Gaul... They actually had, they were one of the first ones to have a double-edged sword. So the Romans thought, oh, we got our tails kicked with a one-sided, one-edged sword. They had two-edged sword. We're going to start making two-edged swords. <laughs> Great thought. So they started making two-edged swords. And the two-edged swords they made were so deadly that they were known for going into the person. And when they thrust it into all that, they would rip out all the insides of a person. I know I'm getting a graphic picture this morning. Praise the Lord. I'm sorry. I, I, was, a, I was a guy. I watched G.I. Joe too much as a kid. I'm sorry. It was, um, but check this out. Here's the thing. When this sword went into it, that sword also, 
There's another terminology when it says two-edged sword. You want to know the Bible said why it says a two-edged sword? I'm going to break this down. In the Greek, it means, and let me, let me just pull this up real quick because I, I need to make sure I quote this right. Because when I break this down, this is going to be awesome for some people. Check this out. Let me read this real quick. The word two-edged in the Greek means distones. Distones means two-mouthed. When the Bible says sharper than a two-edged sword, that's what it means. Distones, that word, means two-mouthed sword. Well, where was the one mouth? One mouth is the mouth of God when he spoke the word of God. The other mouth is our mouth when we speak the word of God. That's why confession is so important. Because when we speak the word of God, God's already spoken one side of the sword. And when we speak the other side of the sword, the devil better look out. Because he's getting a sword right inside of him that's going to pull out some entrails and knock him out. Here's the thing. I'm going to break this down. I'm going to end here, get, get going on ending here soon. The ways to use our armor against attacks, number one, we have to have thought identification. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 and 9. I'll just be quick. It says, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary roars around like a lion. <laughs> He's trying to devour us, kill us, steal, destroy us. John 10, 10, you can look that up on your own. But vigilant here implies ever on your guard. You know why the Bible talks so much about war and weapons and battles, and which I love? Um, and armor and all that stuff, the reason why I talk so much about that is because this, is because God, the Bible, is actually a military book. It is. That's why God has a chain of command. That's why my boss is sitting on this front row right here. Like Charlie said, I, I totally agree with him. <laughs> my boss is right there. <laughs> but here's the thing. God has a structure to things. And God lined this up. He said, be sober, be vigilant, vigilant, be on guard. You know what the, the military does when they set up camp? They, they build a perimeter. Those of you Army guys in here, you know this. You make a perimeter to protect the camp from enemy invaders. Those, those guard, the, 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 the guards that are sit on the wall and they guard stuff, they sit on the wall. Those guys that, that are checking the camp, they go around with guard dogs and stuff. They check for drugs. They check for contraband. They check for things that are going to affect the camp inside. God wants us, the first thing with thought identification, we, do, we have to do thought identification with whatever thoughts come into our brain to make sure to guard our camp, our spirit man, to make sure, is this thought from God? Does this thought line up with the word of God? You might say, oh, I had the thought of having a sickness. Well, does sickness and disease line up with what Jesus died for us for? No, it doesn't. Okay, my finances aren't where they need to be. Well, does uh, poverty line up with what the Word of God says? No, it doesn't. We need to identify, does this thought line up with what God put in his Word? That's the first thing we got to do. We got to set up guard. We got to inspect it. I had a, a great pastor one time teach me. He said, Kevin, it's not what you expect, but what you inspect. You can't be walking out here and just expecting everything. Well, I expect this. Like, well, you got to inspect some things. You got to inspect what you're watching on TV. You got to inspect what you have on your on your computer. You got to inspect what you allow in your doorway. You got to inspect what you do with your time. I know my God. He's sitting up there half the time with half of us, myself included, saying, hey, are you, I, I want to talk to you, man. He's trying to talk. He's like, I want to talk to you. We're just like, I'm too busy. I, I got this going on. I got that going on. We got to make, like, like uh, I think Charlie said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's got to come first. His time's got to come first. That's why we're here. Number two, we got to quench the approaching thought. We talked about this in Ephesians 6.16. Extinguish means to cut off or to remove from its fuel source. The fuel source of our thoughts 
is our attention. We've got to cut it right off. When we see it, we identify it, we see that this isn't God, we've got to cut it right off. We've got to say, enough with this thought. The next thing, the final step, bring the foe or the bad thought into captivity. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it says, bring into the captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You've got to capture those bad thoughts. Jesus spoke to those bad thoughts. That's how you capture them. You speak to them. When, when the devil tries to come at you with some, some nasty stuff, you've got to speak to him and say, it is written. Just like Jesus said, he said, it is written. So you don't have to live with that. Amen? Praise the Lord. And not every thought is, is from the devil. We like to say, woe is the devil, woe is the devil. Well, sometimes it's yourself. Sometimes I just got in the flesh. Anybody ever drive down I-25 and someone cut them off? I was, dri- <laughs> I was dropping my son off at school the other day, and I'm taking a left, and, and the traffic got so jammed up, and I didn't notice it that I got stuck in the middle of the intersection. Like I was stuck. I couldn't move back or forth. And this dude with this Ford truck comes flying at me, and he's just giving me the bird. Ah! I was just, I, 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 I was coming out of my skin. I was like, I have to be the Christian. But then I <laughs> have to go back to 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. How many of you have ever had an argument with your spouse? You had to go back to that chapter, and you said, Lord, why would you write that chapter? Why couldn't we just skip past that and have a little war <laughs> and see who wins? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, praise the Lord. Just a little little thought, food for thought for you marrieds, but um, sometimes it's good not to always be the one to have to win. I lost a lot of battles, but, man, I won a wife. Praise the Lord. I'm just kidding. It, it's true, but anyway, <laughs> those of you who are married know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, First, one, first, I want to just remind you guys, you guys taking notes. It will take effort to investigate these thoughts. It will take effort to investigate, to find scripture, to fight this battle. Here's the thing. The great thing about the battle is we've already won. I was a uh, chaplain for the Longmont High School football team in this last season, and we, went, we, we played this team. God bless them. I'll just leave them unnamed, this high school. We knew we were going to kill them. I mean, it was, we mercy, they have a mercy rule, and the mercy rule is done after halfway through the first quarter. <laughs> it was bad. Uh, and, uh, you know, the funny thing about it is we still had to practice that week. We still had to go out and play in the game. Here's the thing. You still got to know the word. You still got to speak the word. But you've already won. He's not even, he can't even compare to the weapons you have. He's got nothing. He's already been crushed, defeated. But when you exercise your weapons, they are so powerful. I mean, that's why Paul's trying to say, look at all you got. Look at all this. And here's the thing. And I'm going to break this down to you. And I, as I was studying this, and I've given tons of scripture this morning, but the key here with the battlefield of the mind and this is, I, I believe this is the, a lot of the, the issues we face. The key is agreement with God. When we get into worry, do we realize that when we get to worry, we get into fear, we get into doubt, and we say things that are contrary to the word of God? We're having an argument with God. Do you realize that? We're arguing with him. But, Lord, you don't know about this, but, but this and but that and but this. I said, will you just agree with me? I'm ready to get this taken care of for you. Just agree with me. But, Lord, you don't. I, see, here's the thing. We've got to agree with the word of God and say, God, your word's true. I'm going to stand in agreement. I may not see it. I may not understand. See, part of us is us understanding. <laughs> we like to understand everything. We like to put things in a little box, have a little, little thing here, and everything lined up perfectly even. And God says, no, no, no. I'm bigger than your box. I'm bigger than your situation. You aren't going to be able to comprehend everything, but I want you to come into agreement. I'm going to leave you with this verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I'm going to break it down. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It says, and we know that for those who love God, 
all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We know. My question to you this morning, if you know that all things work together for good, that means that whatever situation you're facing, it has to work out for good based on the Word of God. If you follow the Word of God, you speak the Word of God, you send that two-edged sword at whatever situation is coming at you, you know that God's going to make a way, God's going to have it taken care of, it's going to happen for your good. Here's the thing, guys. The battlefield of mind, it's simple. It's summed up. Like I said this morning, it's all summed up. It's all summed up. thing I didn't go to, I, I meant to go to earlier. But in 1 Thessalonians, Paul talked about two pieces of the armor. Well, you know, in 1 Thessalonians, when he talked about two pieces of the armor, that verse there, it's in your version notes. I, I, I sometimes go around the bend and everywhere when I do notes. Uh, but that verse back there, the funny thing is that Paul only knew two pieces of armor. His knowledge of the full armor wasn't until Ephesians, until he got put in prison. Think about that. So even though, yes, we have armor, armor, and yes, First Thessalonians would have been fine. Hey, we probably would have been good. Two pieces. We're good. All right. But the fact that God brought out the entire full-blown armor is God trying to tell you this morning, look at all the abilities I've given you. It's greater than you can even imagine. So why are we as Christians sitting back in our pews every Sunday, hearing a good message and going home and doing nothing with it? Why aren't we going home and saying, look at all that God's given me. Look at all God's provided for me. Look at the power that he's provided in my life, that I can go out there, that I can, that I can expand his kingdom. I'm just going to break this down for you guys. We I, I love what God does. We've got leaders in our leadership team that have overcome, that have come from drug-ridden homes, growing up in drug-ridden homes. We've got leaders that have overcome having parents die at a young age. We've overcome that uh, leaders that have overcome single-parent homes and abuses, that God's used them to step out because they realize, you know what? God has a greater purpose for my life. God's got great things for my life. And just because this happened in my life does not mean that God's not got better things for me in my life. You've got to know that no matter what you face. Here's the thing. It all has to do with your thought process. What are you putting in? What are you agreeing with? Are you agreeing with the situation that's, that's not of God? Or are you agreeing with God and his word? I don't know about you, but it's good when spouses and marriages agree. It's not a good time when, when, mar- when you're married and you've got a wife and a hus- your husband and wife and you guys aren't agreeing. <laughs> There's not a lot of happiness, is there? No. It's good when you come in agreement, isn't it? Where two or more are agreed. Praise the Lord. That's a good thing. So, guys, let's come into agreement with God this morning. Amen? Let's come in agreement with his word. And let's walk in it. And let's let his armor, his weapons go out there. Like I said, not flesh and blood. Go out there and produce the fruit that we need in our lives. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm just going to end here. This, this, why don't you guys stand to your feet t- today? Praise the Lord. Go ahead and end. And... Uh, there's more that I could have said, but I just felt like that's what God wanted to get out. And I don't know who this is for this morning, but I'm going to encourage you guys. There's nothing too great for God. There's nothing too impossible for God. We talked about this this morning and so many different scriptures I could go to and show about it. But there's nothing that's impossible for our God. So whatever you're dealing with this morning, whatever you're facing, it can be a situation at home. It could be a situation in your marriage. It could be a situation with your, your child. It could be a situation with whatever. God has victory for you in that situation. But you've got to make that decision saying, I'm going to decide to believe God's word this morning. Amen. Uh, uh, prayer counselors, you guys can come forward. Go ahead and come forward. And uh, let's just go ahead and we're going to pray real quick before we go today. I want to say a word of prayer for everybody. And uh, if you need prayer this morning, you know, I want to encourage you, you know, get up front here. These prayer counselors, they're here for you guys. They're here to help you through. You know, 
I don't know about you, but we're natural beings. I, I need people to walk through stuff with me in life. I do. I've got a pastor here that I can go to. I can say, Pastor Mario, I'm dealing with this, man. I need your help. And he's, he's there right there every time. I'm a success as a, as a Christian man of God because of this man right here. I've gone to him. I've said, Pastor, help. You need somebody in your life like that. These prayer counselors are there for you. So let's pray real quick. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this morning, Father. I thank you, Lord, that through your word you showed us this battlefield in our minds. It's, it's the battle we fight. It's the only battle we fight, Father God. It's, it's the battle of, of thoughts determining which ones are from you, which ones are not from you, which ones are from just us being us sometimes. But Father God, I thank you, Lord, this morning that we're going to go home. We're going to identify. We're going we're gonna to put everything in our life under a microscope and say, is this of God? Is this not of God? Is this where I need to be? Is this line up with the word of God? And Father God, we can reevaluate our lives. And as we do this, Lord, we can say, you know what? I, I, can, I can do without this. I can do without that. I, 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 can, I can shift this and shift that. And I thank you, Lord, that every person in this room has a destiny and a purpose that's so great. It's bigger than what they could imagine. They may be even in their 70s or 80s and feel like, well, you know, my life, I've lived my whole No, no. You've got time to do such great things that God wants to use through you. God wants to do so many things through you. So, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for from young to old this morning, Father God, that we can serve you, we can follow you, and we can do great things with you, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen.